to the Akeda Project. We invite you to join. One story, many angles. Come learn with us. We are going to look together at Israeli poetry that has related to the Akeda. Now, even suggesting that for a topic is a little bit presumptuous because I cannot even start to tell you the body of Israeli poetry that is based on biblical motifs and among those, those particular poems, sometimes stories and prose that are connected to the Akedah. Uh, one can, I think, very easily guess why is that the case, because of, of the many biblical motifs that Israeli poets address themselves to. The Akedah is very close to the painful part of Israeli reality, where sons are sort of perceived as sacrificed for a national goal, a higher goal. And oftentimes the Akedah related poetry refers to that. The poem I have chosen to, to, uh, to share with you today is one that I would consider a basic one, a milestone in that story. And I can even prove that to you. Because if you look at the slide on the right-hand side, you see the uh, screenshot of the cover page of a book. This is an anthology that had appeared in Israel in the year 2004. It's not the only one, trust me. It is called La Netzach Anagnech, which means I shall sing your tune forever. And it is a collection of Israeli poetry based on biblical motifs. And Milka Shaked, who is the editor of this particular anthology, had chosen to place smack in the middle of her cover page a quote from this particular poem. So I think if that is the case, it tells you a little bit about its importance and its place in Israeli reality and in the body of Israeli literature. Another introductory word. One would oftentimes assume, especially if one doesn't live in Israel, that being able to write and to read a modern poetry based on biblical text will say something about the writer and the reader's religiosity or level of observance. And you need to be very careful of that assumption because, and this is a sentence that people who have studied with me in the past know as Rachel Korzim cliche number one, there is a number two as well, and Rachel Korzim cliche number one says, fluency in biblical lore in Israeli society has nothing to do with your level of observance. This is the case because Tanakh, Bible, I'm not talking about the references. I'm not talking about all the levels of the Mishnah and the Gemara, etc. Just the plain biblical text is taught in Israeli public schools. And we study it regardless of our level of observance. We oftentimes are very familiar with biblical stories. I occasionally check with my grandchildren and I can tell you this is the case. Chaim Gori, born in the year 1923, passed away only two years ago, so we can call him a contemporary, although the particular poem that we are looking at today was written pretty early in both the history of the State of Israel and of Chaim Gori himself. It is called Heritage, but let us look also at the Hebrew original. I insist, even though most of you may not be fluent as a Hebrew speakers, because here and there, I will want to point out to you a particular thing that is worth pay attention, paying attention to. Let me read a little bit of the Ivrit to you, and then we will switch back to the English. Yerusha Chaim Gori. העיל בא אחרון ולא ידע אברהם כי הוא משיב על שאלת הילד ראשית עונו בעת יומו ערב. Let's settle for this. Heritage by Chaim Gori. The ram came last and Abraham did not know that he, the ram, came in answer to the boy's request his first thanks at the time of his warning day. So first of all, look at the title, Heritage in English, Yerusha 
in Hebrew. Indeed, that is the translation. Just bear it in mind because we will come back to these two words asking ourselves, what exactly is our heritage? What exactly is the thing that we carry with us uh, from the Akedah, from the binding of Isaac, according to Chaim Gori? So the first thing that one may want to pay attention to, and every biblical scholar, rabbi, student, whoever you may be, will ask yourself or you'll yell at Chaim Guri, Rega, Rega, hang on for a minute, sir. What do you mean the ram came last? What, are you coming in at the end of the story? Already at the denouement, at the happy ending? And what about the call? And what about the three days from Beersheba to Jerusalem? And what about the climb in the mountain? Do they not matter? You start your Akedah-related story at the very happy ending, the cavalry have arrived, the ram came last, so what's the point? So I think the first thing that I would like to leave with you today is, for Chaim Gori's message, is that the Akedah story does not end with the seemingly happy ending of the arrival of the ram. For Chaim Guri and for many readers, the Akedah story and our relationship to it only start at that point. So that's the first line. Then notice Abraham did not know that he, etc., the ram, came in an answer to the boy's request. In this poem, Yitzchak is seen as a young boy and not as Chazal, our sages, will see him later. That also is a level, if you wish, of your own particular reading of the story. But what Chaim Gori is suggesting, therefore, that all along, as they are walking those three days, as they are climbing the mountain, Yitzchak continuously Praise and request, please don't let him do it, please don't let him do it, etc. There is a constant dialogue, according to Guri, between Yitzchak and God, asking Dara to help him against his father. And Abraham did not know. So that's the first stanza. There is a nakuna, is something missing in Abraham's attentiveness to his son who is constantly praying. The old man raised his head when he saw that he was not dreaming and the angel stood with the knife falling from his hand. So hang on for a minute. It's not only Yitzchak that was praying. Abraham too was dreaming all along and suddenly the ram comes as his answer to his dreams. So what does Chaim Gori actually suggest here? That there is absolutely no communication between father and son? This one is making his prayers, the other one is dreaming his dreams, and they cannot talk to each other? Is that the message? Is that Chaim Gori's reading of contemporary Israeli society? There is a break in communication. Fathers have one type of dreams, Sons have other requests from God. We come to the most problematic two lines of this, and those of you who are people of literature and can count very quickly, you will see that this poem has 16 lines, which is the 14 classical of a sonnet with these two lines added in the middle as if, like a sort of a superposed burden on the classical structure of a sonnet. This child freed of his bonds, so his father's back. Uh -huh. So that is the moment. This is why the poem starts only after the ram had arrived. Because the story Gori needs to tell us that even though Yitzchak was not sacrificed, once he was freed of his bonds, he could not face his father anymore nor could his father face him. Is that the heritage I'm asking you already? Because we are coming to that very quickly. And now look at the shift in tone. Indeed, as if it was a sonnet, and we finished the first eight lines, and we are ready to face the following six, and there is that classical sonnet shift in tone in the middle. 
And the Chaim Gori espouses some sort of a legend storytelling mode. Yitzchak, it is said, was not offered as a sacrifice. Hmm. Chaim Gori is suggesting that he doesn't believe it fully. He lived a very long time seeing the good until the light of his eyes dimmed. Hmm. But he bequeathed that hour to his descendants. They are born with a knife in their heart. So first of all, these are the two lines marked on the cover page of that book that I showed you. Let us look at the Hebrew original of what we have just read. Please note the word horish. Let's say it's our descendants. There are two words that we need to notice. The Hebrew title is Yerusha, and then what the English ha has is heritage. And then when we come to the last sentence, the last verse, he bequests, that is not the same root as heritage. While in Hebrew, it is the same, Yerusha, so the end of the poem in Hebrew is verbally and sound-wise connected to the title. Because you may ask yourself with the English, so what exactly is the heritage? But the Hebrew leaves you with no doubt. It has that our horish Yerusha he bequeathed to his son. And then that heartbreaking, literally, pun intended closure sentence with a knife in their heart. Note, of course, the word knife, because if we were to translate it back into the Hebrew, colloquial modern Hebrew, you will come up with the word sakin, which is what you would use for either spreading jam on your slice of bread or cutting your steak. But the Hebrew does not have sakin. The Hebrew has ma'acholet, which is a ritual knife a sacrificial knife appearing in the whole of the Bible only twice, and one of the two cases is the binding of Isaac. So here's a poem that indeed leaves us together with a very complicated heritage. According to Chaim Gori, all generations following Yitzchak are born with a knife in their heart, all generations following are indeed inheritors of that hour. Hashahahi, that hour. And you'll have to think that I think, according to this poem, that hour is the moment when father and son can not anymore look at each other eye to eye. I think that will do for today. I could spend hours on this poem, trust me. For today, I would just like to wish you a wonderful year and thank you for being with us today.